So we'll get started, and uh, I'm going to talk now about uh, interventions in adult congenital heart disease. So we've got five talks that in, in 10 minutes each, so rapid fire before afternoon tea, and then uh, the last few talks later on this afternoon. All right, so it turns out that uh, interventional uh, procedures are, uh, have made good inroads into adult congenital heart disease in a subset of what have we've seen this described this morning as the simpler uh, defects. And remembering that these are young folks mostly, or uh, young adults, who really don't want open heart surgery or don't want another open heart surgery, uh, or who will end up with open heart surgery and uh, we can perhaps uh, defer or delay that. And so some of these four procedures, in particular for four uh, congenital heart lesions, have turned out to be very useful. This is typically the world of the hybrid operating room with uh, a full operating suite and full cath lab all in one room, lots of televisions. And the key, key feature from my point of view in these rooms is that everybody can see everything. So the cath guy has to be able to see the echo, the echo person has to be able to see the angiogram so that you're all on the same page. And so having all these things folded back, and there's a complete set of monitors up here for the echo person, complete set of monitors here is, is key. So let's go through the four defects that we can do interventional procedures for, from the most simple, uh, which is the atrial septal defect. And the first one of these, at least in Queensland, was done in May 1998. So we're coming up for the 20-year 20 20 year anniversary of doing Amplatzer ASD closure. And I remember at the time thinking uh, that this is the beginning of a revolution and how true those words were, in that uh, this paved the way for us to be putting all these various gadgets into the heart. So secundum atrial septal defects are uh, now... Um, the standard of care would be to put an amplatzer device in if you can. So who has an atrial septal defect? Well, it's easy when it's easy, and you see great big flow like this on transthoracic echo, and um, no one would miss this, but atrial septal defects are notoriously difficult to see in some of the bigger adults, particularly uh, heavier folk, because uh, they're in the far field. And so there are, there are traps, and it's easy to, not easy to miss, but concerning if you do miss, and particularly some of the anatomically more complicated ones like, say, sinus venosis. So we did look at this some years ago, and we've got a large cohort now of people with ASDs, and we came up with this thing, the relative atrial index, RAI. The RAI is the right atrial area to left atrial area ratio, RA to LA. So if your RA area, a normal human being, might be 15 square centimetres apical four chamber, and your LA area is 20 square centimetres, apical four chamber, then this relative atrial index will be small, i.e., in this case, 0.75. Whereas if you've got an ASD, the right atrium, the right ventricle is enlarged, of course, and the, in this particular case, maybe the RA area might be, say, 24, the LA area uh, might be, say, 14, and so the relative atrial index, or RAI, is 1.7. And Natalie Kelly, who you saw speaking at lunchtime, uh, looked at 200 and some of our people with atrial septal defects, and it was very clear that if your right atrium is bigger than your left atrium, that is, that the RAI is more than one, there's nearly 100% chance in our cohort that you had an ASD or a shunt defect. And if it was less than one, there was nearly 100% chance that you don't. So it's a very good take-home message that if your right atrium is bigger than your left atrium or the index is greater than one, then you have to, you have to explain why it's either a shunt or some other thing. It's not normal to have that relationship. And similarly, we found that when we closed these things with, de with a defect uh, device, that the next day it normalised. So we, you'd think that years and years of volume overload would make this irreversible stretching. But the next day, they were back to normal range, and then over 30 days and, three, and, and one year, there was a slight, no a slight uh, trend towards uh, more normal, but in fact it was the next morning, the pre-discharge echo, they'd normalised their atrial size. Quite remarkable and surprising to us, actually. So we saw this already. What are atrial septal defects? What it's, what's out there? Well, secundum is the majority. The primums are the complicated ones we heard about this morning. Sinus venosis ASD, they say 5%, but I would doubt that it'd be even 1% in our, in our world. You see one of these every year or two, as opposed to you see 20 or 30 or 40 of these every year on, in routine adult practice. And coronary sinus unroof defects. Now think about the imaging. The imaging is phenomenal if you, think, if you look at the 3D. So I ask you, to, when you look at 3D, to think where are you standing and where are you looking. So in this particular view, we're standing in the right atrium. In fact, we're actually standing in the right axilla, in the right armpit, looking through the person uh, into, their, into their right atrium. And so you see up here the superior vena cava, big tubular structure here. You see down the bottom, obviously, inferior vena cava, and obviously a large atrial septal defect. But the key feature of all of 3D echo, 
everything, but so particularly with ASDs, is where is the aortic root? The aortic root, this thing here, which I've super, superimposed here, is anterior to the atrial septum. And in fact, the non-coronary cusp is associated with the atrial septum. And so if you can see the aortic root, and you must make sure when you cut your 3D, you get some aortic root in the picture. If you can see the aortic root, then you know that that is the anterior most part of the atrial septum. So, and we refer to this bulge here of the, of the, of the aortic root as it bulges into the uh, atrium as torus aorticus, the bull's head of the aortic root bulging into the um, into the, uh, into the atria. And so it's very important to get torus aorticus and a bit of aortic root into your picture. And so that's obviously the, uh, the aortic margin of these atrial septal defects. Tricuspid valve is to the south, and we call this the posterior margin uh, towards the spine. Now turn the, the same block of tissue over in the 3D scanner, and then you get this picture. And I encourage you always again to figure out where the aortic root is. Uh, I've superimposed it upon there but you can usually see a little bit of aortic leaflet there. If you do that, you'll always get this right. Atria, secundum atrial septal defects are usually northern structures. They're up usually at the north of the atrial septum, and this large tubular uh, structure here is right upper pulmonary vein. So get the aortic root and torus aorticus, and get the right upper pulmonary vein in the picture, descending aorta on this one, mitral valve there, and torus. So this picture is looking from the left axilla, so think of where you're standing and think where you're looking to get the margins of this. Now in 2D echo, we take pictures and, and in trans-esophageal echo, all imaging is, or the majority of imaging is done looking from above. So in this picture, you're looking from the head downwards. This is the left atrium, obviously, right atrium, obviously the defect there, and you're looking from above. Tricuspid valve is anteriorly. The cusp of the aortic valve, which is nearest to the left atrium, uh, to, to the atrial septum, obviously is the non-coronary cusp. So that was, that's the first view that we like, which is the, the short axis view there, 60 degrees, and this is the second view that we like, which is the bicable view, which is typically 90 degrees, sometimes 100 or 110 degrees, depending on the, on the anatomy of the person. And remember that in this picture, if you roll the probe right, so clockwise with your hands with a toe probe, you'll get to the right upper pulmonary vein, which is coming in just up here. And then we like to make measurements, and then uh, the gold standard back in the day was uh, surgical closure of a a atrial septal defects, and the shortest amount of time measurable in the world was the time between the diagnosis of an ASD and the attendance of a cardiac surgeon in the echo lab. Um, because they used to like doing this operation, it's a good operation with said to be 0% mortality risk. So it, it is and was a good operation, but it still is surgical, and the ability to put this device in, the Amplatz closure device, changed everything. So this device, as you can see there, bridges the atrial septum with a pad on the LA side, a, a neck which is sized on the, in the middle so, so it self-centers, and a pad on the RA side. First thing you have to do is size the defect with a, a sizing balloon because no matter what you measure, 3D, 2D, MRI, it's never what it actually is in terms of the device. So you measure it at 12 by 12, it'll be an 18 device because there's quite a lot of stretchability in this tissue. So we stretch them to their maximum stretch size. Then you have a, a, a large blue catheter coming in from the right femoral vein across the hole from RA to LA. And remember, in, in 3D, we look from above, and, this, and the orientation is slightly different, but the same thing, with the nozzle of the catheter sitting into the, into the left atrium. Torus there. Then the first head of the device is deployed, which is usually mid-atrium here. Shaft is coming back here. You pull it down. Uh, there it is in 3D. You pull it down onto the uh, septum and then deploy the neck. The neck is important to have, this is the thing that's sized by the balloon and it makes so, sure that the device has to be centered because the, the neck of the device is the same size as the hole. Then deploy the second head and end up with the device sitting nicely like that. We like to look for the right upper pulmonary vein to make sure that it's not in, in, intruded upon, it usually never is. And we like to use X-plane like this to make sure that there is membrane in between the two pads in all parts of the, of the circumference of the device. In fact, actually quite difficult to see, and sometimes we pull down hard on the guide catheter to actually spring the thing open so you can be sure that you're sure that there is membrane in there all the way around. We look at it in 3D, both from the um, LA side and the RA side. I'll put some landmarks on there for us to have a look at. The value of 3D, amongst other things, is telling us sometimes when there's dual holes or multiple holes. So in this, it's quite not uncommon for there to be a filtrum or a, or a divider a sort of a, a strand, if you like, left of, 
of uh, atrial septal tissue, dividing it into two areas. And depending on the size of the strand and the size of the holes, we'll sometimes put two devices in these, or sometimes we'll tear, tear the strand with a slight sizing balloon and put a great big device in. And like that, the colour there shows you quite clearly the, the, the differentiation. We like doing this now with ice so that we don't have to have general anaesthetic at all, and this gives us left to right inverted pictures. Now, what about VSD? VSD, as we heard this morning, is a, a variety of types, but the commonest being this perimembranous uh, uh, subaortic kind of VSD like this, and this does lend itself particularly to percutaneous closure. And so you can see there we use X-plane a lot to identify where we are. And per, as per David Salami this morning, you look for whether the, the defect is under the tricuspid valve, like this one, or under the pulmonary valve. This is, a, this is the majority, of course, under the tricuspid. And then we pass in a catheter from above and try and cross a defect. We can, we can pass these devices uh, retrogradely, that is, from aorta back through the hole, or anterogradely, that is, from uh, the venous system and then through the uh, hole and deploy that way. Either way, we catch, this, catch the wire with a, so a lasso so that before the final deployment and in, as part of the process, there is a wire going from femoral vein across the hole, through the tricuspids, across the hole, out the aortic valve, all the way down to the groin and out through the femoral artery. So this is what we call this around the world wire and allows us to get the thick sheets into place uh, without flopping out. We use 3D quite a bit for these VSDs, and just to, I just put the VSD there in, um, in uh, blue, so have a good look there to get the anatomy. Always get some aortic valve in there, that helps you get your orientation. And this is a catheter going, I think this one was a retrograde one, where we're coming here through the hole, left ventricular outflow tract here, RVOT here, muscular septum here, uh, uh, membranous septum here. And you can see the close relationship between the bottom of the, of the aortic valve and the, and the uh, top of the defect there. Important to make sure we don't uh, to interfere with the motion of that uh, aortic leaflet. So here it is, the catheter is through and through, round the world, uh, and through the defect. You can see the colour. And we're starting to deploy now. So the first, similar to the ASD device, the, the, the head of the device, this is a retrograde one, is being deployed into uh, the, uh, the right ventricle there, and will be pulled back against the, uh, the, through the defect. Then the second head is deployed like that, and you can see that it looks quite angulated, not axial, and this is always very concerning. But so long as you've got this margin here on the, on the, on the right side of the heart, not the left side of the heart, the thing will fall back into place nicely. And so we spend quite a great deal of time being sure that it's appropriately straddling. Once it's sure, then we deploy the device and let go of it, unscrew the, the guide catheters, and it flicks back into place like that nicely. Now, what about pulmonary valves? Well, we get into pulmonary valves in, in the interventional world uh, in this sort of situation here, where there is narrowed conduit or troubles with a leaking conduit after uh, childhood repair of tetralogy. Uh, we've sometimes been involved where there's been a ROS procedure and difficulties with uh, the uh, allograft. And we've been involved using this, this uh, device here, which is called the malady valve. Now, the malady valve... Uh, is a cow's jugular vein, so it's a very fragile, quite flimsy uh, device. It's mounted in a stent uh, to, to support its leaflets and uh, is uh, uh, relatively limited in its maximum size. It's balloon inflated, but as I said, quite fragile. It's done for pulmonary stenosis, say in this case, and a catheter is placed from femoral vein up through the tricuspid, up through the pulmonary uh, RVOT into the pulmonary position. But what we've been doing is in many a case, is uh, ballooning open the stenotic area first. So this is a balloon in the MPA. And as you can imagine, there's not very much blood flowing through there because the balloon is inflated. Making sure we don't occlude any of the coronaries as we, uh, with the thing inflated. So there's RVOT, and that's pr approximately where the valve level would be. Then we blow up a stent, a hard stent, a powerful stent, to hold that RVOT and pulmonary valve open, and then, then gently blow up the malady valve inside it so that it's not taking all that incredible pressure that it took to expand the, um, uh, the RVOT and pulmonary uh, valve. So this is a valve, a valve stent in a stent to hold the thing open. Impressive results from the malady valve, although interestingly over a lifetime we've only done uh, 16 or 18 of these, uh, maybe 20 now. Quite, quite, 
quite remarkably uh, low volume, really, for a big hospital with lots of adult congenital heart disease, but good results in the long term, uh, and we've been happy with this device. There is now another TAVI-type device about to become available for the pulmonary physician, which we're going to do the first ones of in about two weeks' time. And lastly, coarctation. We've heard about this before. Coarctation or recoarctation lends itself particularly uh, to stent-type procedures. This is very little echo involved in this one, so not truly really my, my territory so much, but it's something that we do do. And in the angiogram room, you see these sorts of pictures. We do actually sometimes have echo for these, but mostly it's decorative. So uh, this is basically an angiogram procedure. So angiogram like that, or aortogram, blowing up of a sausage-shaped balloon, and always concerns me uh, how that the aorta will give safely without... Uh, 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 catastrophe, but it does. And once it's inflated, then a self-deploying a self stent like this is implanted and gives usually a beautiful result with almost no gradient. And this is, a, this is the standard of care now for these coarctations, <laughs> leaving a picture something like this. So I'll leave you with that at this stage, and that's the roles now of interventions as I see them in adult congenital heart disease. So I appreciate that.